The purpose of this video is to discuss the differences between artificial selection and natural selection. The first thing we need to talk about is the concept that Charles Darwin was aware of the idea of natural selection. We're looking at the beginning of this chapter really through his perspective. And when it comes to Charles Darwin's understanding of the world, he was aware that people at his time were artificially selecting certain species and traits then in those species. A simple example of this would be people were artificially selecting pigeons. Uh, at this point, it's like carrier pigeons. There were also individuals who were doing farming that would artificially select the best livestock. So whether they were like the biggest cows or the ones that produced the most milk, whatever the trait was that they were looking for, if they had an individual that showed that trait, they would then breed that individual for the future generations. So um, not only did this apply to livestock, but also crops at the time. And I'll show you an image in a minute of the way that our crops have definitely changed over long periods of time. But one uh, example to look at first would be dogs. Um, most people are familiar with at least some different dog breeds. The thing that you may not know is that all dogs are descended from wolves as their ancestors. And dogs are technically all the same species since we can breed them together and then create fertile offspring. Uh, so they're basically just different breeds of the same species. So it's amazing to think that the wide variety of dogs that we have today, you know, everything from Dalmatians to Bulldogs to, you know, tiny ones like Chihuahuas, and then our large ones like Great Danes, they all came from the same original wolf species. And slowly over time, people bred them to become domesticated. Uh, we're actually seeing in Russia, they're doing a similar thing with foxes. They took wild foxes and they're breeding them over many generations to domesticate them. And the way they do this is actually quite simple. They just select the ones that have the best temperament. You know, that's really the trait that they're selecting for, right? Is their temperament around people. So you can imagine that that was something that early people probably did when they came across, you know, a, a wolf pup that was somehow docile. You know, they were able to take that one in if it was somewhat, uh, had, had like a kinder temperament, you know, it was more receptive to people. They were able to breed them over time, and eventually dogs became almost like, uh, they talk about them as being man's companion, but they're definitely um, sort of a, a working species. You know, most dogs had a role that they fulfilled, whether it was like a herding dog or a retrieving dog. They had some kind of defined purpose. You know, whereas now in our society, that they're pretty much purely pets. I mean, very few dogs are, are working dogs anymore. But if you think of you know even German shepherds you know that are used by police officers so something like that as a is a working dog that does perform you know a defined function that was really how dogs started in human society and all of the various individual species that we see are just individuals that are related to this original ancestor and over this long long period of artificial selection or selective breeding as we call it they, uh, they went through and selected for certain traits that were considered to be advantageous. So that's one simple example. Another one for us to look at has to do with corn. As some of you may know, uh, modern corn is actually very different from the ancestral plant species that it came from. Uh, Teosinti is the original species that modern corn is modified from. You can imagine uh, when people were planting this early on, what they were doing was they would select the ones that provided them with the biggest kernels or the largest ears, and then eventually you get to our modern corn species. Uh, modern corn is a little funny to talk about because it is somewhat genetically modified at this point, which certainly gets beyond the concept of artificial selection. But corn had a more modern appearance long before people were going through and genetic, genetically uh, modifying it. A lot of the early changes here just came through artificial selection. It makes sense if you're a farmer growing corn that you would naturally save the kernels or the seeds, you know, from the best crops that you had the year before, and then those will be the ones that you plant for that next year's, you know, crop in order to provide you with the best possible outcome. 
So these are just two uh, small examples. I mean, you could go through examples uh, almost endlessly for artificial selection. But there are, are many, many things that people have done to do this over time. And this is one of the ideas that contributed to Darwin's idea of natural selection. The fact that people can go through and they can select for certain traits in a species. Well, Darwin thought maybe nature could do the same thing. Maybe natural events would select for a certain trait. I'll try to show you some examples in a minute of some ways that that would be possible. So if we switch gears for a moment and begin looking at natural selection, uh, we'll look at two small examples, but the overwhelming idea here before we start is that nature will have certain conditions that will favor traits within a species. So those natural settings are going to sort of naturally favor uh, one of the potential traits. So if we take a look at a simple example here, we have a bird species that happens to prefer green beetles. Now the green beetles and um, we've got, I guess they're orange beetles, right? They're of the same species. That's just a natural variation. So think about what we're doing our Punnett squares. We'd have one of these as a dominant trait, you know, one of them as a recessive trait. So the birds happen to really like green beetles. So as you can see, they're eating uh, the majority of them that are green. So generations later, we're now seeing sort of a 50-50 split between the green and the orange beetles, whereas in the early generation, the orange ones were definitely the smaller ones in the group. They were less represented in the population. Generations later then, uh, it turns out we end up with basically all orange beetles, or I guess this picture really says that they're brown, right? So the, the ones that are not of green coloration, those are the ones that have flourished because the green ones are more commonly eaten by this bird species. So it could be something simple like predation, but it doesn't always have to be something that's driven by a predator eating off one of the species. It could simply be that one of the species is more adapted for getting food. As uh, we'll see with Charles Darwin, he studied finches, and the finches, which are a bird species, uh, they had different shaped beaks. And the shape of their beak would align with the food that was available on the particular island where that finch was living. So in that case, it doesn't really have anything to do with predation, like this example. It has everything to do with being able to get food from their natural environment. So there are many ideas. I don't want you to think that um, they're all driven the same way. But we'll just go through, you know, again, a couple of examples to paint this idea. Uh, the second one I'd like to talk to you about are sharks. Uh, many of you are probably aware that most sharks follow a similar uh, coloration pattern where on top they have a darker coloration and then on their bottom side they have more of a white or like a lighter coloration. There's actually a reason behind this. Sharks, as predators, do need to blend into their environment because they need to be able to sneak up on their prey as much as possible. If the shark can be sneaking and get closer to its prey, it'll expend less energy catching that prey, and that's good for its survivorship. Right? That's an, good for its, uh, its fitness in the environment. So if we look at this shark from above, you can see the reason they have dark coloration on top is if a fish has a perspective looking down at them, they're more likely to then blend in with the dark environment around them, much in the same way that if a fish or other you know, aquatic species, prey species, is uh, looking up at them, they're more likely now to blend in with the surface with the light coming down if they have a light underside, the light bottom. So a lot of the coloration strategies that we see in nature are things that are blending into their environment and it's something that gives them an advantage. Uh, if you think about some of the things in nature that don't require blending into their environment, uh, there's usually one of two explanations for that. One of them is usually it's like an apex predator. It's something that uh, is not going to be preyed upon by any other species. Um, even something like the, the shark, right? The sharks are definitely apex predators, but they still have coloration to blend in. Uh, another example would be something that's like toxic. If you think of the poison dart frogs and things like that from the rainforest, you know, they have very bright, almost like fluorescent coloration. They're not concerned about blending in because they're toxic. Uh, it's actually a great way to identify some things in nature that would be toxic or poisonous 
oftentimes brightly colored things that don't need to blend in with their environment have some kind of alternate means of protection. And in that case, you know, the toxin or, uh, or the poison would be those means of protection. So again, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to cover all of the examples or all of the even just different kinds of examples of natural selection. But hopefully those two examples of artificial selection and two examples of natural selection give you an idea of the concept that we'll be using and building upon as we work our way through this chapter. Um, as always, I appreciate you taking the time to watch and make sure you answer the questions after the video. Thank you.